England, once dominated by Roman conquerors, this tiny island nation rose to become one of the largest and most powerful empires in history. Its reach stretched around the globe, spanning every continent. It was unimaginably large. Technology, innovation, ambition, these were the tools that built this massive empire and produced the formidable British Navy, a powerhouse that dominated the world's oceans. The Royal Navy is like the Microsoft of the global system in the 18th and 19th century. They are everywhere. The British Empire constructed massive symbols of dominance that still invoke awe today. But the foundations of that empire were built on ego bloodshed and a relentless drive for conquest four ten a.d. the most powerful empire the world had ever known is under attack at the far edges of the British Isles the once mighty Roman legions march toward the coast in full retreat. They leave in their wake a military and political void. For the first time in more than 400 years, the vulnerable island nation of Britain must fend for itself. It was the end of one empire and the beginning of another. The sun never sets on the British Empire. I've heard those words all my life, ever since I was a kid, even though I've never lived in England, and that empire is long gone. Hello, I'm Peter Weller. At its height, the British Empire covered almost a quarter of the Earth's land mass, some 14 million square miles, and if you think about that, that's just staggering. But how did an island, if you will, in the middle of the North Atlantic come to be such a behemoth empire? Well, in the early 400s AD, when those Roman citizens were fleeing in the face of an onslaught of Vikings and Jutes and Angles and Saxons, some of those marauding and plundering people decided to stay. Maybe they liked the temperate climate. And after several centuries, they'd organized and developed themselves into somewhat of an Anglo or English identity. But with the death of the last true Saxon king, Edward the Confessor, the door was open for another people to step in, the Normans, who were essentially descendants of the Vikings living in northern France. And at the Battle of Hastings in 1066, the Normans did that very thing. They took England under the leadership of a man named William, who we call today William the Conqueror. With a ravenous lust for power, William would stop at nothing to become king of England. To conquer another country like England, you couldn't really be a, a sort of touchy-feely kind of person. You had to be a very strong leader, and that's what he was. He was a brutal man. In 1066, William made his move. He put together an army of Normans and stormed the shores of England. For several bloody hours, his forces viciously clashed with King Harold's near the English coastal town of Hastings. By the end of the day, with one strike, William had conquered England. Now he would borrow a chapter from the Romans and launch a series of extraordinary building projects that would transform the English landscape. He imposes himself on England and he builds these castles around the country. Now we look at castles and we think, don't they look nice? A Norman castle is not nice. It was big, it towered over your town and it was a reminder to say that you are under us now. And of course the biggest one he builds is the Tower of London. William wanted the Tower of London to be intimidating. He chose a location on the bank of the River Thames that had once been used by the Romans. The new tower would be built on those foundations, capitalizing on the Roman legacy of power and glory. The complex would include a defensive wall surrounding an imposing tower.
can get rid of me. Of course, the people they use to build it are the locals who have to do it, so they use them effectively as slave labor. Building onto the remains of the Roman walls, workers first constructed the barrier around the complex. On the north and west side, where there were no Roman remains, they dug ditches and erected large wooden stakes as a barricade. Then they turned to the massive tower itself. For 700 years, England had relied on simple timber construction. Now William and the Normans would bring back the grandeur of Roman engineering techniques. Like the Romans, William would build his tower with stone. He didn't trust the quality of the local material, so he imported cream-colored limestone from France. His engineers also incorporated Romanesque arches and vaults within the structure for support. Inside the tower's majestic cathedral, workers constructed a series of intersecting barrel vaults, called groin vaults. These allowed the support to rest on four piers, opening a soaring space for windows to lighten the imposing interior. It was a great feat for that time because the English were used to building in wood. So I think it was rather miraculous for them to see this enormous structure go up. It was really impregnable. I mean, the, the walls were tremendously thick and there were just little slits to look out from. The fearsome castle served as a royal residence, fort, stronghold and prison. And intimidation was backed up by swift and severe reprisal against any who dared challenge the king. You get armed men and they go up and they land on your doorstep. They will drive you out of your home. They will burn your home down. They will burn your crops so you've got nothing to live on. And a lot of killing, of course. As the tower neared completion in 1087, William died, ending 21 years of turbulent rule. His imposing fortress would be a reminder of his vision and tyranny for centuries to come. A series of Norman kings succeeded William and continued his work on the complex. But it would be more than 400 years later that the tower would enter its bloodiest phase. And the king who led it there was not Norman, but from the English family of Tudors. He would become one of the most brutal and gluttonous rulers in England's history. His name was Henry VIII. Henry's appetites were legendary. He hungered for food, for women, for power, and for a son who would one day inherit the crown. The best way to fulfill your duty and your destiny as a king is to produce a safe line of male heirs. And if you look at the portraits of Tudor gentlemen, they're standing with their legs apart and their hands on their hips with these big cod pieces. That is not by accident. That is saying, I am virile. Look at me, I can produce families. So a son is a sign of manhood. When his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, failed to produce a son, Henry set his sights on one of her ladies in waiting, the alluring Anne Boleyn. He falls absolutely hopelessly in, both in love and in lust with Anne Boleyn, because Anne is a very, very sexy lady, and she knows it. There's only one problem. Um, how do you get rid of your wife? Apart from murdering her, of course. And the answer is, I've got to divorce her. When the Pope refused to grant Henry a divorce, the king flew into a rage. If he couldn't control his country's religion, he would simply replace it. He boldly severed all ties with Rome and appointed himself head of the new Church of England. Henry now had absolute control over his country. He divorced Catherine and made Anne his queen. But when she also failed to produce a son, she suddenly found herself accused of adultery. The case is made as damaging as it's possible to be, that she's not just having one affair, that she's having a string of affairs, that there are sort of orgies going on in, in the palace, and Henry is only too ready to believe a lot of this. Henry had Anne arrested and held in the greatly expanded Tower of London. By now, the tower complex had grown to a sprawling 18 acres with an impenetrable facade. The wooden barricade had been replaced and expanded by thick stone walls. A series of towers reinforced their strength and stability. 
Just inside the outer wall, a second wall was constructed to provide another layer of fortification. A ditch had been dug around the perimeter and filled with water to form a moat. With these added defenses, the tower complex was virtually undefeatable. Under Henry's ruthless reign, the fortress became the location for an orgy of violence, a notorious prison, dungeon, and execution ground for his many enemies. And it was here that Anne awaited her fate, death by beheading. Axe executions were actually really nasty because it was not uncommon for the axe not to finish the job in one blow. What he does with Anne Boleyn, he says, for you, darling, nothing but the best. Instead of having her beheaded with an axe, he's going to have her beheaded nice and neatly with a sword. On May 19th, 1536, Anne was led to a private courtyard on the tower's grounds. With one swift stroke, Henry's problem was solved. But Henry's longing for a son was only part of a more ambitious quest. Since the beginning of his reign, he had lusted after a dream of ultimate glory to transform England into an empire. This idea of a realm that would cover every part of Europe uh, and extend beyond was always in the back of Henry VIII's mind. His real vision and dream, his great appetite was for dominion and empire. But Henry's road to empire put him on a collision course with France and Spain, Europe's reigning superpowers. His plan of attack? To fill the high seas with floating weapons of mass destruction. Six ravens are always kept at the Tower of London. Legend has it that if they leave, the kingdom will fall. Summer, 1510. An army of laborers scour England's forests, gathering material for a colossal undertaking on England's road to empire. Before King Henry VIII could conquer the land, he needed to conquer the sea. He set out to radically transform the way battles were fought and won by turning his ships into deadly weapons. He is the one who first begins putting heavy guns on ships to put these large siege warfare type guns, ship cracking guns, some of them weighing almost a ton on shipboard that could be used to batter your enemy into submission. Massive guns required massive ships. Henry ordered his naval engineers to build a new and imposing fleet. The centerpiece, his flagship, was one of the world's first battleships. It was called the Mary Rose. The Mary Rose really epitomizes the mentality of naval planners of that age. Get as many guns pointing as many directions on shipboard as you possibly can. And that's what the Mary Rose was set to become, a gun platform. The Mary Rose featured a breakthrough advance in warship design, gun ports. Holes were carved into the side of the ship with flaps that could be lowered over them. These holes allowed cannons to be positioned and fired through the side. Naval designers could now engineer decks dedicated solely to firepower. The added weapons turned the Mary Rose into a killing machine. This was a, a major revolution, really, in ship design, of which the Mary Rose was sort of the sort of very beginning. By the mid-16th century, England's march toward naval dominance was in full flow. But Henry soon ran into a problem. The cost of arming his ships with expensive bronze guns was quickly draining England's treasure chest. He's got to find other ways to produce the kinds of, you know, heavy artillery, which can help his armies and his navy fight effectively, but at uh, a lower cost. And the cast iron guns is the perfect solution. The cast iron gun runs less than a fifth of the cost of a bronze one. A successful cast iron cannon had never been made before, 
but Henry knew how to make it happen. He turned to the country's famous iron-making region, the Weald, and gave his engineers a mandate. The difficulty with casting in iron, a large piece like a cannon, was the fact that, for a start, iron had to be melted at a much higher temperature. There was only one way to get the temperatures high enough, an engineering wonder of the time, the blast furnace. First, workers poured wood and iron ore into the top of a 20-foot tall stone furnace. A water wheel powered a large bellows that pumped air into the fire, stoking it until it reached an incredible 2200 degrees, hot enough to melt the iron. Workers then opened a tap at the base of the furnace. A stream of hot molten iron poured down a trough and filled a cannon mold buried deep in the ground. It was a very big undertaking and it was very pressured as well. You had, of course, charcoal burners who produced the charcoal in the woods around the furnace. You had laborers who dug the iron ore from pits in the ground. Uh, you had teams of laborers bringing wagon loads of ore and charcoal to the furnace. Over the next few centuries, the Weald's iron cannons became the envy and dread of every other European ruler. The transformation is tremendous. It gave England power and a technological edge that no other European power could match. In just 30 years, Henry had built his navy into a powerhouse, but he would never live to see his ultimate dream of European conquest. Enormously obese, his oversized appetites finally betrayed him. He died in January 1547, leaving a legacy of brutality and innovation that stands through the ages. His reign had laid the seeds that would explode into a mighty empire. And Henry lays the foundations all right by building a navy, by building this notion of Britain as forming an empire, an imperial presence in the world. Backed by the growing power of their navy, England's empire would expand over the next 150 years through colonization and conquest. By the mid-18th century, Britain controlled parts of India, Africa, the West Indies, and North America. But two major threats to the burgeoning empire loomed ahead. And the king who would fight them, George III, would also be battling demons of his own. It's always talked about as his madness. It was a physical illness that he had, but the effect was that it affected his brain. George first slipped into madness in 1788, seven years after suffering a withering blow. A small territory a world away had defeated the mighty British in a war of independence. It was called America. When the British troops leave um, Yorktown, when the, the, you know, they, have, they surrender, they play this tune, the world turned upside down. And that is really how it seems. The world has turned upside down, the world's gone mad when rebels win. Over the next decade, George's world slowly caved in on him. Then in 1804, another threat would send the king and his empire spiraling to the brink. French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte. By the early 1800s, the tyrannical conqueror was quickly overtaking Europe. England was his last obstacle to continental dominance. He was as large a threat as the Nazis were in the Second World War. He was amassing the forces for an invasion of the British Isles. England's Royal Navy had become a major force at sea. And in 1805, it faced Napoleon's invasion threat head-on in the momentous Battle of Trafalgar. Using fearless naval tactics and the most technically advanced ships of the age, England annihilated the combined forces of the French and Spanish fleets. Trafalgar confirms Britain's position as the supreme maritime power, and the British emerge as the unsurpassed masters of those naval technologies. But by the time of Napoleon's final defeat in 1815, 
King George III was permanently gripped by insanity, becoming a mere figurehead of power. His mind is completely gone. Uh, his eyesight goes as well, and he wanders up and down the corridors of Windsor Castle, has to be fed like a baby. Um, long beard, long hair, uh, no idea what day it is. It's, it's just very sad. By this time, England was growing rapidly into a superpower, based on the supremacy of its naval engineering. But it would be another realm of technical superiority that would catapult the British Empire to global dominance. The 19th century was about to usher in a period of engineering invention not seen since the Romans. The Mary Rose sank in a battle with the French in 1545. In 1982, the ship was raised from the bottom of the sea. By the 19th century, Britain had developed into an industrial titan, bursting with wealth. Its monumental success came from a period of staggering technological invention that swept across the empire and then dominated the globe. It's hard to think of a period in history where you had so much creativity in terms of, of technology, so much willing to experiment with the possibilities of what you can do with machines, what you can do with engineering, what you can do with architecture. In the past, empires had been built by hand, now the British would dominate their territory with machines. Engineering innovations like cast iron and the turning of a warship into a single ballistic offensive entity with guns transformed the English Navy. And that Navy transformed England into an empire. And that military and commercial empire that spread from Europe to Asia, from the Americas to Africa, dominated the seas. But what about the land? Because by the early 1800s, Britain was jumping with productivity, but lacking in means of overland distribution. Well, in 1782, a man named James Watt perfected an engine driven by steam. But it was 40 years later that George Stevenson and his son Robert took that engine and with a firebox, boiler, piston, and a remarkable invention called the chimney, powered a locomotive called the rocket over tracks at the blistering speed of 29 miles an hour and revolutionized overland commercial transportation with the railroad. The rocket was not the first locomotive, but its unique engineering features proved that steam trains were the force of the future. The key to its speed was in its engine. A series of copper pipes carried hot gases from a coal-fueled firebox through a chamber of water, bringing it to a boil. This created steam that rose up into a dome and was forced through a valve into a cylinder. The intense pressure from the steam pushed a piston rod that connected to the wheels of the locomotive, powering it forward. By venting the exhaust steam out of a chimney instead of the cylinder, fresh air was sucked into the firebox, stoking the fire. With this advance, the rocket could charge ahead at blazing speeds. Of all the locomotives that were imagined at the time, it's the one that looks the most like a locomotive will. I mean, it's, it's going to be improved in innumerable ways, but that basic machine is the one that, that emerges as a locomotive for the next century.